This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. My guest this week is naturalist, conservationist, and writer Benedict MacDonald. Benedict has recently released a new book, Cornerstones, which talks about how by restoring cornerstone species, we can help turn around the current impoverished state of nature in the UK. His previous book, Rebirding, was how I first came to know of him, and I've been a great admirer of his work ever since. We talk about the numbers of UK birds, how land management needs to change in order to stop the loss of species in this country, and what we can do at a garden level to make changes. I mean, the fact is that we've lost the vast majority of living birds in this country over the last 100 years. If you were to add together the units of bioabundance, not just cuckoo as a species, but cuckoos as living birds, nightingales as living birds. You know, 100 years ago, there were cuckoos in every village. It was noted in national newspapers when they arrived. As a matter of course, and, and in, in village newspapers as well, we, we had cell buntings on Wimbledon Common. We had red-backed shrikes breeding by the hundred in the New Forest. And, you know, in the last 100 years, we've lost a staggering volume, not only of biodiversity. I mean, we've lost several species entirely, but you can also have very small populations of species, and they still tick the biodiversity box. But what's really happened has been a catastrophic loss of bioabundance. If anyone speaks to their grandfather about the hedges and the butterflies, you will certainly get from almost anyone over the age of 80 who remembers the countryside a, a completely different vision of what we had. But of course, that in itself is only a snapshot of the wildlife that we had 100 years before that and 100 years before that. And we have effectively been dewilding Britain since the Bronze Age. We have been depleting Britain faster than any other country for a very long time. And that is quite a sobering thought. Yeah, it absolutely is. Also, one of the things that you talk about is the vulnerability of small islands of species populations. A lot of our conservation efforts, I feel from reading your book, is that we sometimes spend money propping up untenably small populations in isolated areas. Is that a problem in terms of conservation? And if so, what can we do about that? I think it is a major problem. I think there are certain species that have been saved using those methods, species that can be quite concentrated, whether that's roseate terns on Cockett Island, bitterns, which can actually attain quite high densities in reed beds. You know, and there are a number of cases where, where those interventions have been extremely successful. But when you look at the collapse of the birds of the wider countryside, you know, what we didn't know and perhaps should have known 30 years ago is that birds exist in metapopulations that exist at a 10 to 100 kilometer level. You need populations of 50 to 60 pairs of curlew in one place, really, to have any chance of saving that population. By the time it's one or two pairs, you are effectively stuffed. This goes for nightingales, for turtle doves. Historically, it's gone for rhinex, for redback shrikes, for all of these species that have slowly vanished over time. So we need to completely reevaluate how we go about conservation and indeed shift increasingly towards restoration. We have already lost the vast majority of wild places, species and bioabundance in this country. So to spend all the money preserving the relics, firstly, doesn't work. And secondly, diverts money away from restoration, restoring land at scale. And that for me now is the absolute imperative of the next 50 years. And also, I think you mentioned some species are kind of almost walking dead. Are there species that you think we need to actually just let go? Obviously, you mentioned turtle doves. So there's some that are just too far gone for us to do anything about. I think there are some where literally there is nothing we can do. For example, I mean, the willow tit is a very interesting one. Yes, it needs very large scrubby landscapes. So that's very much a wet scrubland, a habitat that we can create. However, it's now known that willow tits only thrive along a certain thermopline, namely when winter temperatures reach quite a low level. And it seems that the willow tit is very able to survive these colder temperatures, whereas its competitor species, blue tits and grey tits, aren't. But in many areas, of course, as Britain has warmed up even subtly, blue tit and grey tit numbers have increased, you know, monumentally. And these species outcompete willow tit both for food and particularly for nesting sites. In addition, of course, on top of that, it's got to contend with the rise of the great spotted woodpecker, which in itself emanates from the decline of starlings in our woodlands that used to nick the holes of the great spotted woodpecker. So the poor old willow tit is really at the bottom of the pile. I love willow tits. They're fantastic birds. And I think we should be spending a lot of time and effort in places like County Durham trying to save the species where there are still robust populations. But you know, in most of its range of Britain, the willow tit is now functionally extinct. And unfortunately, you know, we could spend a huge amount of money, but you'd really have to adjust the climate itself 
to get that species back. Especially though with turtle dove, we're spending inordinate amounts of money thinking that we're saving pairs on farms which are already functionally extinct. I mean, as far as I'm aware, there are only two, perhaps three landscapes for turtle dove in Britain that are, are going to keep onto them. And even then, it's going to be a close one thing. One in Bedfordshire, one is the famous Neck Estate in Sussex, of course, where they're thriving in a non-farmed environment. A couple of sites um, where very large landowners are all doing the right thing for turtle doves in, in places like Suffolk. But effectively speaking, you only have to look at a map of the turtle dove's current distribution to see that it is already a functionally extinct species. So in my view, we need to be putting the money into breeding facilities so that when we get the habitat right in 20 years' time, we can flood the place with thousands of turtle doves. They will rebuild their own natal homing mechanisms. What we need to be doing is breeding these birds in captivity in very large numbers because we're not always going to win the first time around. No. So you mentioned restoration of habitats, and obviously there are a lot of landowners at stake in the UK, certainly, and we need large-scale plans and connected habitats to sustain populations. I know it's a big question, but is there a way to achieve cooperation between the landowners in order to get this up and running? It depends on the drivers. Yes, is the short answer. Obviously, if you can turn an 8,000 acre ground sport back to nature through collaboration with the landowner, you can affect change incredibly quickly. But you need to be quite astute about how that's achieved and where it's achievable and where it isn't achievable. A lot of people in Britain are very wedded to degradation, so they're very wedded to thinking that a treeless grouse moor is a fantastic habitat. And of course, if they think it's a fantastic habitat already, it's very difficult to persuade them to change otherwise. Increasingly, though, we're seeing a whole new generation of landowners looking at these fairly knackered landscapes and thinking, well, no, I'm, I want to be more aspirational with my future. You know, people are more cognizant of climate change, of climate resilience. And um, often, you know, I find younger landowners are the ones with the real aspiration to do this. So there is a lot of hope and positivity there. And I think we're going to see a huge amount of this being done by the private sector in the years to come. And you mentioned 20 year timescales. Can it happen that quickly? And I know obviously your new book, I think, mentions ecosystem engineers. How would we employ them to get those changes to come about relatively soon? Well, my new book, Cornerstones, looks at the, the, the keystone species of the British Isles, and particularly its wells and species like boar, but also beavers, of course. And, you know, if there was one animal that can transform habitat better than a human being, even with an entire team of the RSPB behind them, it's the beaver. You put beavers into a landscape, there are so many myriad benefits for biodiversity, fish, trout abundance, kingfishers, water rails, willow tits, the landscape heterogeneity itself, ponds, meadows, flushes, obviously all of the climate resilience measures that they bring flood prevention downstream. Humans can't recreate this. We're not good enough to recreate habitats of that quality. Beavers can because they've been doing it for over two million years and they're very good at it. So, you know, as soon as you put beavers into a landscape, even an entirely degraded landscape, um, as has happened in places in Cornwall, where they've been put into the middle of old uh, livestock farming operations in Kerno, Chris Jones's place, down at Derek Gow's, various other places. The transformation in life has been has quite extraordinary. So we need to look to these keystone species to accelerate biodiversity recoveries. Yeah, and I got the impression again that it's more of a build it and they'll come attitude rather than let's do these breeding programs and then plonk these species down in an environment and expect them to survive. Would that be fair to say? Well, it depends, though. The beaver creates its own environments. That's the amazing thing about it. That's what makes it a keystone species. Otters don't. Otters live within habitats, including habitats created by beavers. Beavers create habitats. So, you know, what do you need to put beavers on the ground? Well, obviously, you need broadly collaborative landowners. You need a fairly large amount of riparian trees already for them to chew on. But apart from that, there are no constraints, no major constraints to where you can put beavers in this country, provided you're responsible enough not to put them in places in East Anglia where they're going to likely may bore into the side of drainage dikes and cause real havoc, unwanted havoc on, on arable fields. But I don't think anyone's really proposing that. But in very large areas of Britain, particularly Western Britain, where many waterways are already wooded, you can just put beavers in. They create the habitat and transform the landscape. And we're talking there, I think, more large scale. And I wondered if, again, this is probably like a how long's a piece of string question, but is there a minimum area of land within which you can hope to make a difference? 
this podcast is geared towards gardeners and a lot of us will be trying to make a difference at a garden scale but are we wasting our time is that just too small scale no no goodness me i mean let me tell you i've rewilded my 40-foot garden in bristol and the recoveries of species i haven't actually reintroduced anything yet um although i'm planning on putting back a few species of invertebrates but at the moment the the amount of life that pops up in the middle of a city when you'd have thought it would be completely extinct. I mean, glowworms, for example, has been an amazing revelation this year. It turns out there's a thriving colony along the Bath and Avon canal system, which is about two miles from my house. And I have glowworms now under my buddleia. I have a thriving colony of cinnabar moths um, that appeared as if from nowhere on the ragworts that I established. I've recorded over 250 invertebrates in a casual survey just done by me. And I would say the bioabundance of the garden has probably increased by about 50-fold since um, skimming off the lawn, putting in about 14 species of native trees and probably close to 100 different species of vascular plant. So that's just a 40-foot garden conjuring up glowworms, cinnabar moths, a variety of beetles, hornets, hoverflies, sawflies, bee flies, grasshoppers out of apparently nowhere because there must have just been the vestigial relics of those species in the surrounding landscape. Now, if my whole road does that, then you will multiply that by 100. But if the whole of Bristol adopted that policy in their gardens, then you you could be seeing whole species moving back, you know, into the city, species like spotted flycatchers. So there's no limit to this. Of course, if you say you can't start small, then it's like, where do you start? So... I would say to anyone with a garden, just create as much floral variety and structural variety as possible using native species. Be fairly aggressive with making sure that if you're trying to rewild a lawn, for example, you've got to skim off that awful lawn grass and basically get it back to bare earth and then reseed it to get your full diversity of wildflowers back. So I've got lots of advice on that, but absolutely it's worth it. It's, It's enormously rewarding and we've got to build these things from the bottom up as well as the top down. I was going to ask you a question, actually, where I attended a talk, it was a while back now, but a representative of the Forestry Commission was actually there and they were advocating planting non-native trees, particularly in cities and urban locations, because they were saying that our native trees are susceptible to too many pests and diseases. What would you say to that as a, a kind of advocate for native tree planting? Well, no, I mean, we've got, we've got dozens of species of native trees, all of which come with a vast majority of British wildlife attached to them. Non-native trees very rarely compute in the same way. They tend not to have the same associated connections, um, ecosystem connections, uh, mycorrhizal connections, invertebrate connections. So no, it's a very, very bad idea. They may be talking from a forestry point of view, but the bottom line is a lot of tree diseases come in on non-native species. We're incredibly reliant for our forestry in this country on Sitka spruce. So I think we want to be diversifying our forestry sector But, you know, you go down for a walk in the New Forest where you can see almost every species of native tree in Britain growing in its natural configuration. It's by far the richest place of biodiversity that I'm aware of anywhere in the UK, the old pasture woods of the New Forest. And you wouldn't want to replace that at any cost. This was a conference actually for garden designers and landscape architects. So it was more of a kind of residential and probably small scale public plantings they were referring to. So, yeah, that's interesting to note. Obviously, you have made changes to your garden. I think some people find that when they let their gardens maybe go a little bit wilder or they change perhaps some more ornamental species out for less ornamental native species, they might face a bit of a backlash from their neighbours. Have you found any problems on that front? No, not at all. I think there's curiosity and I suppose maybe living in East Bristol as a general sort of love of all things green. It's very green, liberal city. I think that there are also ways of letting things go. I mean, there's literally letting your garden be dominated by one species like nettle or bramble. But actually, my view is you have to be very active in a small space. You have to kind of pretend to be the beaver. You have to pretend to be the horses and the cattle, you know, going around, you know, having a little bit of bramble, but then ripping it out so it doesn't, you know, encroach onto your wildflowers. You know, you do have to still very much garden your garden. I mean, I 
have one corner where I permit bramble because I know what bramble is good for nesting birds and pollinators and all kinds of insects. But equally, I don't want it smothering all my wildflowers. And, you know, I can still create a little bit of an aesthetic by mowing around the edge. So I keep nice low areas. Firstly, of course, that allows me to move around the garden. But secondly, it allows blackbirds and song thrushes, the pasture feeders, if you like, to still be able to come down and access food. And robins, of course, love a bit of open soil and lawn. So it doesn't just, you can have extraordinary floral diversity, but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to um, completely sit back and let things go. And in our garden systems, would we be the keystone species in that environment or are there other things that we'd be looking to attract? There are two keystone species in a garden, really. One of them is us. We are the habitat creator, but the habitat maintainer, of course, especially on the wildflower side, is the rich array of bee species. Bees are a keystone species. So I have now various solitary bees in my garden, red mason, leaf cutter, various bombus, uh, bumblebees, honeybees, um, ashy mining bees from uh, the local little nature reserve, I believe. And all of which are carrying out vital ecosystem roles, which, of course, we can't do. We humans cannot pollinate flowers. So working in tandem with your bees, creating log piles, drilling holes in the end of logs to increase your solitary bee populations, these things will all really help. And thinking more about the bigger picture again, I know certainly in one of your books you mentioned that a lot of problems that we've faced in terms of how we manage land in the UK for farming and otherwise have been related to the EU's common agricultural policy. And given now that we have gone through Brexit, how are these things likely to change in the future? Well, I think we are cautiously, as a wildlife community, optimistic that we are moving away from paying for ecological destruction towards paying farmers to do what they're very good at when you pay them, which is to aid nature's recovery, particularly public money for public goods for the ELMS scheme. Now, of course, you know, is ELMS the be-all and end-all? No, it isn't. But at least if we have a system that, broadly speaking, rewards woodland creation, wetland creation, not farming to the edge, not have been paid more for the more livestock you have raising the place to the ground, then that's a very positive step. So I think you know, we, have, we have to make sure that Elms isn't watered down, which I'm sure many people would like it to be on the, on the extreme farming union side. But things are heading in the right direction, I believe. Brilliant. And this is anecdotal. Somebody that I know got some grants for rewilding their farmland, which is grazing at the moment. But then I heard that they were actually putting some of those grants. Is that the case, do you know? No, I don't believe it is. I think there was a lot of hopeful backlash in the times and papers that are still shockingly ecologically illiterate when it comes to how important these things are. Sort of say, oh, fantastic, the government are getting rid of all of this for in to favour food production. I don't believe that's actually what happened at all. The overall amount of money allocated for this over a long period, which is, of course is what matters, is still very much there for the aspirational nature recovery in Elms Tier 3. And I think what was downscale was the number of pilot projects. So, no, I, I think anyone thinking that probably, at the moment, we don't have major cause for concern. And also thinking bigger picture, you mentioned in one of your books that money could be made from ecotourism if land was reclaimed by nature. And that would be a very important source of revenue for a country that's quite obsessed with revenue streams. But I wondered if actually is it the scarcity of species that induce people to pay to visit and see them? And if they became more commonplace, would there be such an incentive to travel and look at these species? Yeah, actually, that touches on my day job now. I work as head of nature restoration for Real Wild Estates. We're a company specialising in just that. But I think the thing is, when you're running land for nature, ecotourism is an important part of the bigger picture. You know, that could include extensive meat sales and, and sort of low intensity produce. It could include biodiversity payments and grants. But of course, also entrepreneurially connecting yourself to the private market for things like carbon, all of this. But there's no doubt that ecotourism is an incredibly powerful driver. I think it's probably overstated, maybe in 50 years' time, if everyone is still in the countryside, then to some degree, yes. But it's not just about the species. It's about landscape. It's about sense of place. You know, there's never going to be another Murray Firth. There's never going to be another North of Gods. These places are a combination of cultural icons and increasingly wildlife icons as well. If people come to Somerset to see Dalmatian pelicans in the future, They'll obviously be going to see the pelicans, but they'll also be going to see that whole landscape, the history of Glastonbury and the tour. You know, we do have a very rich human history in this country as well. So I don't believe people go to areas simply to see a species. But when a charismatic species is present, far more people go and far more money comes in. 
Yeah, I think we've forgotten how to celebrate our regional differences to a degree, so I'd be all for that, certainly. And is there anything else that you wanted to say to people in terms of encouraging them to get involved or movements they should be supporting, things they should be aware of? Just any final thoughts, really, for people listening? Well, I think we have an amazing opportunity now in this country with sort of farmers, landowners, the private and public sector all coalescing towards restoring nature. And I would think try and engage with some literature, even things that challenge you, for example, books by George Monbiot, even if you don't necessarily share those views. And, uh, you know, I've obviously written a couple myself, Isabella Trees Wildings, another fantastic book, that really remind people what is possible. Imagine if we put the same ingenuity into our nature recovery as we have done into our wonderful NHS, into our fantastic aerospace engineering sector and all the other amazing thriving industries we've got here in Britain. Imagine if we lavished the same investment and intelligence and vision on nature recovery. We would have lynx in Scotland. We would have Dalmatian pelicans in the Somerset levels. We would have elk with no fence collars in Scottish glens that the collars preventing them getting onto the roads and causing any incursions into farmland. You know, the greater use of technology to even open up the possibility of species like wolves in the future. All of these things are possible if we want them and if we really apply ourselves and we can really have some quite extraordinary wildlife in the future. And the most amazing thought is we can do that without compromising food production. So there is hope, but it bears repeating that we need to make changes and make them very fast. Thank you to Benedict for talking about his vital work and thanks to you for listening. Dr Ian Bedford is here now to talk about the scourge of the topiary gardener. The relative ease of importing goods from almost anywhere in the world nowadays ensures that many different exotic or seasonal flowers, fruits and veg are readily available for us to buy throughout the year. Such as strawberries from the Iberian Peninsula, green beans from Africa or cut flowers from South America. Importing plants and produce from foreign lands, though, does, however, create an opportunity for certain notoriously invasive non-native species to enter Britain. Whether these be plants, animals, or diseases, they'll all be of concern to us, since their appearance could risk new problems for not only our crops, but our native biodiversity and our gardens, too. But Britain has been experiencing invasions from non-native species for hundreds of years and it's demonstrated that the problems they cause are rarely long-lasting. Either the invader can't survive through a British winter or, as it spreads and becomes more numerous, native predators begin accepting it as an abundant new food source and begin naturally controlling it. Then, over time, the invader may become just another resident species within Britain's biodiversity, joining a long list of others that include red lily beetle, western flower thrips, and spotted winged fruit flies. But knowing that doesn't lessen the importance of trying to prevent other invasive species from entering Britain by checking plants and produce at our borders. However, it's inevitable that some will always get through. And one that succeeded, which is still very much in its rampant stage, is a medium-sized moth distinguished by its white wings with iridescent brown borders, the box tree moth. Originating from East Asia and first discovered in Kent during 2007 on imported box trees. The box tree moth is a serious pest of Buxus species, where its green, black and yellow striped larvae cause defoliation and dieback as they feed amongst the matter webbing they spin around themselves. Having rapidly spread across much of Britain, we now know that it copes well with our climate and that once established on a box tree, it's very well protected within its webbing from predation and pesticides. However, we also know that box moth now has a problem, which relates to the fact that its larvae only feed on buxus. Since here in Britain, the overwhelming majority of buxus is grown in gardens. Gardens where buxus hedges and topiary are steadily being killed by box moth infestations and are being replaced with alternatives such as you. 
You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.